Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have to apologize for some of the slides. Some of these slides will be uh, offensive to some of you. But please bear with me. There are lessons we have to learn from uh, stories, like the story I'm going to tell you now. This is Doha map. Lisa Clayton was driving from her uh, from friend's house to her house at point one. This was during Qatar National Day. It was 18th of December 2009. Distance between point A and point one is nine kilometer. It took her three and a half hours to reach home. She get there, she was so furious, so angry, these are scenes of Qatar National Day, the last Qatar National Day. She was so angry, so unhappy, she sat in front of the computer and wrote what she think or what she saw. And uh, this is part of her story. It was published in Qatar Living. It's very known sites here in Doha. This is what she wrote. I've been chief editor of three newspapers here in Doha. If this article comes to me, I'll publish it. I have no problem with such, with, 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 uh, such an article. Somebody might add, uh, advise me to cut the last line in the first paragraph, so not to upset anybody. The rest of the, rest of the article is okay. It has no problem at all. But let us see what happened. As soon as he published that, comment came pouring into Qatar living. In the beginning, they were objective, okay, no problem with them. Then it's starting to get bad and worse. Look at the top paragraph. This is very offensive. People didn't like it. And people thought, this is very ugly. We have to fight back. Most of them were students from American universities here in Doha. Those, they started anti qatar living page in Facebook. Then a university professor, a Qatari university professor in one of the universities here in Doha, she wrote this in her blog and she asked her students to contribute, to write back, because she was upset with all these comments came to Qatar living site. So student start writing in Dr. Amal blog. Lisa came back, came back again and she apologized for the story she written in Qatar living. Let us remember now, what she wrote wasn't that bad. It was a comment came on Qatar living where really start the ball rolling and it offended Qataris. Now, the fight started, started now between Qataris and non-Qataris. So Lisa Clinton apology at this time was really insignificant. It wasn't, has no meaning. The war was more than Lisa Clinton, Clayton. The story uh, was carried by, uh, uh, by the Peninsula newspaper, and from there it was in all headline news. And then Lisa started to feel the pinch. Her life had turned upside down. She lost her contract, or about to lose her contract. She lost so many friends, and she started uh, to isolate herself from her community. So she wrote this apology again and published, published it in any site she found it possible to publish. I'll just give you a few seconds to, write it, to read it. It shows you the impact 
that came back to Lisa, to Lisa after publishing that piece of a story. And really it shows that whatever freedom you have, once you sit in front of your laptop or your computer, it could be a weapon either directed to other people or to yourself. This is the first email I've got from her. She keeps on apologizing to everybody. But really, was it her mistake? I think it wasn't her mistake. It was Qatar living webmaster mistake. He didn't monitor his site. He kept all this garbage coming in and kept them in his, in his uh, site. I counted how many comments. There were more than 80 comments in Qatar living uh, uh, site. The webmaster didn't even have a time to clean it. And without knowing that he, or knowingly maybe, he is going to disturb the life of somebody. Another example. This is Khaled Al Mahmoud. He's a well known writer here in Doha. He has the same family name as mine, but we are really only friends. He wrote something similar of Qatar National Day, how people, or especially young people, have abused that day. I have tried to translate what he has written in Arabic. These are part of his writing. Believe me, I tried my best to make the translation as easy as possible because what he has written was more stronger than this. He even described those who have abused the National Day as being donkeys. Yet, Khalid's life was intact. He didn't lose so many friends. He didn't lose his contract. So what's the difference? Most of... I've been chief editor of two sites, Al Jazeera.net, the Arabic site, and the English site. We used to have so many people coming to the Arabic site, and less in the English site at that time. Yet we, have, we used to have so many comments from people reading the English site. Somehow, people in this region came to know the hard way that once you express your feeling, you might be in trouble. So they kept their own feeling to themselves. And that came on advantage to Khalid. Young Qataris who have been educated in Western University, they tend to be more open and could enter into dialogue and could deal with the media easy, easier than those who have done their education in an Arab university. It's because of different in education. We have to agree that there is a sensitivity uh, for any criticism which comes from a foreigner in this region. It's not here in Qatar, it's all in the, it's, it's all in the whole region. Reaction to any piece of story you write will depend on these factors. So think about these factors before writing any story anywhere in any language you think. Khalid's story was published in an Arab newspaper. I used to be a chief editor of that newspaper three months ago. We monitor the site closely, 24 hours a day. And that helped to keep Khalid's life intact. With Qatar living, they didn't even keep, or they didn't even dare, or they didn't even care to, 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 to check the comments. And that's why Lisa Clayton's life was turned upside down. If we have a group of people who are willing to disturb your life, they could do it if they know exactly what they are doing. And those who have commented in Qatar living, they know exactly what they were doing. We all agree on this.
we don't have regulation here in this part of the world regarding media at all. Nothing for TV, nothing for radio, nothing for internet. And if you ask anybody about the red lines, he will give you like four red lines. Government, head of states, religion, culture. And you could interpret that in, in the way you like. And this is a very big problem. In Qatar in particular, or maybe in most of the Gulf states, we, we consist of minorities. Just think about it. Everybody in this room is a minority. If we start attacking each other, then we will have a terrible life. So how can we give people a freedom to write whatever they, they want and monitoring the, what they write? It's a very difficult balance, very delicate. This is how I see people using the internet here in Doha. Those who get their information through English sites and those who get their information from Arabic sites, they don't talk to each other. Sometimes even there are different stories in each site, as if they don't talk, as if they are not in the same country, which is really very strange. And those who don't use the internet at all, they get their news from radios or Al Jazeera or whatever. Lisa, Lisa's story was a very big story in the English sites, but we didn't see it in the Arabic sites at all. We didn't see it in Al Jazeera. We didn't see it in any FM radio at all. So Lisa was spending her time somewhere in that circle, only in the English site. And that area, gray area between these two uh, circles for those who master two languages and could shift from here to there. But there are a few of them. So if you have a problem in the, in the, in the world of internet, you are somewhere there. Nobody knows about you. I guess Lisa is there somewhere. Lisa is a very good friend of mine. And I hope, really, she comes through all the, her problem. And she stays with us here in Doha for years to come. Please, if you have any comment or if you have anything to say about the coming uh, rules, media rules here in Doha, send it to my email, which is written there. Thank you very much. OK, I'll hand straight over to Jeff, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. It's late in the day. Probably about every hour we should have been dropping the temperature a couple of degrees and turning the lights up a little bit higher, so it'd be about three or four degrees now. I um, had made some notes uh, last night on some of the things I'd talk about in the future, and yet many of those got talked about today. So I think I'll shift gears and really talk about the future by looking at what we see among teenagers and their behavior in this area of media literacy and what you can expect in the future from your children, your students, your consumers, your customers, your friends, the kinds of things we're seeing around the world with people between the ages of 12 and 24. And I'll try to look at which of those things we think they will outgrow as they get older and will change and which of those things they're doing they'll take with them the rest of their lives. But the first thing we see is we think teenagers around the world, as I mentioned very briefly this morning, will never read a newspaper, but will read some magazines the rest of their lives. Magazines that only contain news or information are Newsweek or Time in America, Maclean's in Canada, Der Spiegel in Germany, we think will be gone three, four, or five years. The internet simply does it better, faster, cheaper. But some magazines will be around forever. Women's magazines, magazines that women read as much for the advertising as the content, the pull and sniff perfume ads, the thick glossy paper. For a woman, the experience of reading Vogue online is not very satisfying. 
We think teenagers will never own a landline phone. Don't even make the distinction between a landline and a mobile phone. And one of the things we discovered by accident, we're not the only ones to discover this, teenagers aren't wearing watches. They're telling time from their mobile phones, and now the entire jewelry industry, not to mention the economy of Switzerland, is waiting to the answer to the question, will they start wearing watches as they get older? Well, we've been tracking people for 10 years. We have people in our sample who are 25, 6, and 7, who were 15, 16, and 17 when we started. So far, the answer is they're still not wearing watches. Uh, we think teenagers, if you talk to them about the days you used to watch television when a broadcast network told you you had to watch television, you're going to sound to them the way our great-great-grandparents would have sounded to us talking about horses and buggies. Something we find worrisome about teenage behavior, but they seem to outgrow it, is teenagers trust unknown peers more than experts. They argue that the unknown peers they meet on Facebook or MySpace or Bebo are just like them and have no self-interest and can be trusted. To the degree that an unknown peer really is a peer, they may be right. But we also know that unknown pre peers can be predators, scammers, or even worse. Teenagers don't care about the source of information. Most of their information comes aggregated on places like Google, Yahoo, and MSN, and other places. Uh, and even though the source of information is there, they don't look at it. They don't care. Happily, as they get older and they make more important decisions in their lives about careers, investments, relationships, retirement, and health care, all of a sudden the source of information does become more important to them and they grow into caring about the source of information. Something that I think is charming about teenagers and their media literacy, they think they're unaffected by advertising or brand. They think they're too smart, too sophisticated, too cynical to ever be affected by an advertisement. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. If you want to see how much a teenager you know is affected by brand, try giving her, him or her an MP3 player that is not an iPod and then duck quickly as they throw it back at you. Uh, as I touched on this morning as well, among teens today, community is at the center of everything they do. As I mentioned, it's the first thing that we've seen that's caused people to log onto the web more than to check their email. Social networking is how they get their information, how they communicate. It's become the thing that anchors everything else on the web. Teenagers, as we look at their behavior, don't expect to pay for digital content now or in the future. They think that all content on the web ought to be free the way the good Lord intended it to be. They understand that if you go to a bookstore and you order a book, well, of course you pay for that. That's physical goods. But digital information somehow miraculously puts itself together at no cost, incidentally, and that's the way they should be receiving it as well. Everything does move to mobile, as I also mentioned this morning. The penetration of mobile around the world is extraordinary. I heard it was 150% here in Qatar. Actually, I was in Macau about three months ago, had dinner with the Minister of Communication, and he said in Macau it's a pretty extraordinary situation. Mobile phone penetration is already at 230%. The average Macanese has a Macau cell phone with a Macau SIM card, a Hong Kong phone and a Hong Kong SIM card, and some of them have mainland China phones and SIM cards as well. We've already seen how mobile phones can cause farmers in parts of Africa from towns that don't even have electricity for the first time be able to communicate crop prices and make a better return on their crop. An entire infrastructure will never have to be built. We know teenagers want to move their content freely from platform to platform, irrespective of anyone's desire to restrict them. As a matter of fact, the more we try to restrict them, the more they'll move their content just to show us they can move it. 
It was a little over two years ago when the iPhone was first introduced. And for the six first six months, it was only available legally in the United States and only available legally from AT&T. I say legally because within days, I was seeing iPhones all over the world. But in the US, it was in June of 2008, teenager was on his way to college and spent his summer becoming the first person to unlock the iPhone. He was being interviewed by the news media, the case on his iPhone was off, wires were hanging, solder was falling out of it, and when he was being interviewed, he admitted he didn't even want an unlocked iPhone. He just wanted to stick it to Steve Jobs and show Jobs that you couldn't lock the iPhone on him. That's the generation you're dealing with. People who will learn things simply because they want to show you that you can't contain them, you can't control them. This is a generation that wants to create its own content, is as interested in blogs and Twittering and all of the other kinds of information they can create on YouTube as they are in traditional or professional media. And for those of us who think we're hip and cool because we're online and we send email to today's teenagers, email is something their parents do. That's old person stuff. They're communicating through IMing, social networks, Twitter, and a whole variety of other ways. They have lots of time. Of course, teenagers don't realize how much time they really have until they're older and it's gone. But they have lots of time. They like synchronous communication. They can be in front of a screen at the same time as their friends are. As they get older and pesky things get in their way, like jobs, spouses, and children, all of a sudden asynchronous communication becomes much more appealing. One of the nice things about email is you look at it when you feel like it and you answer it even later. But to summarize, the most important change we're seeing around the world and the one that is, I believe, permanent and stays with them forever and is not a fad or a transitory phase is empowerment. The power people think they're gaining, the power they're gaining over journalists, that they will read a story in the newspaper or online and will communicate immediately and directly with the journalist and tell him or her how they got it right, or more often they'd prefer to tell him or her how they got it wrong. They'll add content to that story. The power they're gaining over physicians. There's practically not one of us today on the internet that if we have a sneeze, a sniffle, a problem, before we go see the doctor, we look it up on the internet, we see what the possibilities could be, then we go see the doctor and we want to be a member of the treatment team. We want to talk and share and tell them what we found and explain and explore different possibilities. Sadly, we do this with a doctor who more often than not wishes we would just shut up and take our medicine. But doctors are going to have to face that. Automobile salesmen have realized the entire ways that cars are being sold are changing because people are coming in with information they never had before, changing the negotiating process. The entire funeral business is changing because of the internet, people gaining information they didn't have before, and relationships with governments and politicians. In Estonia, any citizen can propose a law and within 24 hours, they guarantee there will be some answer, at least an initial response to the proposal. I had a taxi driver who was very proud that one of his proposals actually became a law. And politicians all of a sudden, for the first time worldwide, we hope we'll see it everywhere, have to answer questions and are more accountable. So we see this tremendous amount of power that people are gaining and uh, uh, what I think will be an absolute resistance to ever surrendering it again. So that's a little bit of what we see with the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.